We'll see. Do good. Oh yeah. Well, and Bryce is here, so he can. Find it. Hey, good morning, guys. We're gonna uh, we're gonna get started. Just a couple uh, quick updates. Uh, the prayer sheets are in the back, so if you have a prayer request or an update, uh, Hazel, we need to make sure we know what's going on in your family. So, and where's Faye? Faye called me this morning. Her daughter is doing a drug test paper. She's probably a female. Good. Okay, so if you guys remember Faye, we're praying for Faye. She was having this uh, radical surgery on her neck. Her neck sounds like it went well. All right, so we need to keep praying. So let's make sure you get back. You can write that down for Faye. Yeah, any other prayer requests that you want to share, make sure we get them back. I know Barbara's been out for a couple of weeks. Hopefully she'll be back in a week or two, uh, Barbara Stevens. So Jenny's good to see you here. So we're going to do John's service on Saturday uh, in the sanctuary, all right? Um, it's where we're going to be at 1.30? What time is it, Jenny? At 1.30. Okay, 1.30. Um, all right, so for the, the trip that we're going to do in November, for those of you who, who are involved in CIA, um, I think the sign-up is in my office. Everyone else wants to sign up. But the, the hydrofoil, it's here. All right. The tickets are still not on sale on the website yet. I have had a couple people say, um, hey, can I buy my tickets? The answer is yes, but we can't buy the tickets until they have them available for sale on the website. So last time I checked, after last week or two, there were 30 signed up for that. So I'll probably buy a, a bank of 30 tickets. And then we'll just sell first come, first serve. And if we have to add more tickets later, we can. So that's November the 12th for your calendars, where we'll take the hydrofoil over to Tampa. We'll take the hydrofoil to the trolley, the trolley to Ebor. Um, what's the name of the restaurant we're going to? Columbia. The Columbia. The Columbia and Ebor. And then we'll just turn around and come back. So um, we'll put the times out. As we get a little closer, we'll have the details on the times. But it's getting close. Like, it's already mid-October. My goodness, it's, it's crazy how fast time is going here. So... Um, then this week, this week there's the homecoming over at Northside. I don't think they announced that uh, in Sunday, but yeah, it's homecoming this week out at Northside. So the big homecoming football game is Friday. You know what time the football game starts? So the football game's at seven. If you want to go to the football game out at Northside, seven o'clock at the big stadium out there. And uh, then Saturday, or actually the next Sunday is the carnival here. So that means for next Sunday, uh, next Sunday we won't be meeting in East Hall because this room will be decorated for the carnival. So both the Spanish service and this group get bumped because the room will look like a carnival set up for that night. So we're just going to stay and meet in the sanctuary. All right, so Lenny will be preaching from stage. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to be sick, right? No, so we'll be, so next week we'll stay in the sanctuary. And I think John and Cindy will be back. Am I remember correctly? Yeah, they'll be back next Sunday. So so for those of you that are in Home Builders that have been joining us, you're welcome to um, to return to Home Builders, or they may still come. I don't know. It's up to John and Cindy when they get back. We'll have your room painted, though. If you've been in 101, your wall is almost done. That wall that was torn apart, it's almost fixed, and we'll have your room fixed for you. And your wall will now be light blue. Have you been in 101 in the last couple of weeks? Yes. Did you accidentally go to one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Today. So one on one had that had that green olive color green wall that you guys had in there. It it will become a baby blue wall and it will have math stuff on it from the math teacher at Wellmont and Wellmont starts on Monday. Uh, there well they've been here the, the the teachers and the faculty have been here but the kids start on Monday actually most of the kids come on Tuesday and we are ready we are ready for them. You know Wellmont was supposed to come in January right and then they bumped it up to October so we were scrambling getting ready but praise the Lord I think. I think we've got everything ready. There's going to be a few things. We'll just work through them. So, um, All right. How about anything I've forgotten to announce before we get going here? What else am I forgetting? We have gotten to plan. We have not planned. It got bumped because of the hurricane. Our trip to feeding Pinellas. And you're out this next week. All right. So we're going to reschedule that. Bryce, maybe you and I will get together on this today or tomorrow. We'll reschedule the feeding Pinellas probably to November um, and do that then. We are going to plan probably to do, let me actually, I'd like to get, if you're in CIA, I'd like to just talk to you briefly. We would like to sponsor, like we have the past couple of years, a Thanksgiving meal. But to do that, we have to just have, a, have to have a few volunteers. Is there anyone that is able to come on Thanksgiving either the day before, which is Wednesday, where we prep some of the food, and then Thanksgiving morning where we actually serve? Anyone available for that? Can you just raise your hand and I can just get a quick idea? Maybe one here in East Hall? Okay, all right. So what I'll do is I'm going to reach out. Okay, do it. I'll reach out to you guys. We'll put a, a sign-up sheet in the back, too. I know Rachel. Where's Rachel? Gotcha. Rachel usually comes and helps Tamara cook. 
So we think we'd like to do that again so that people on Thanksgiving, we don't want people to be alone on Thanksgiving. So we'll open a stall, we'll serve a meal, and uh, we'll, we'll offer that, I think, is what we'll do. So, okay, I'll keep you posted on the details of that. All right? All right, Bryce, anything else? You know, I wasn't here last week. At the last minute, I went to send you a picture. I'll, we'll have a picture before the end of the day, uh, before the end of our class. So last week, Tamara and I made an unexpected trip up to the North Georgia Mountains that we stayed with Scott and Tracy Jetty. Remember Tracy, who was in our class, right? So Tracy and Scott have invited us up. So we just, Tamara had Monday off, and we went up there, and we had a blast. Uh, but I didn't have a single person call me and tell me that they missed me because there were donuts, and in lieu of Darren, donuts is evidently better. So that's what I heard. Yes. Did you enjoy the donuts last week? I asked uh, her to, I, I texted Mandy, I said, if you wouldn't mind, just you know, leave me any donuts that are extra. She's like, oh no, oh no, Darren. <laughs> there were no extra donuts. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I did notice that. I noticed that the attendance is drawn by the donuts, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did. A few people came and then left. They're like, no food? We're leaving. There's like a connect group in South Hall that has food. We're going to go there. <laughs> Um, hey, Don, real quick before we get started, can you come up for just a minute and tell us about what the school did this weekend? Oh, hey, we, we volunteered you to cook. I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, well, yesterday I had the privilege. Um, actually, I got a call from the school uh, asking me to go down to Fort Myers Beach, uh, kind of a hurricane relief mission. And... Um, I really didn't want to drive down there, to be honest with you, but God convicted me, and I went, and it's, well, it was actually a, a, a thrilling experience. Uh, it's, whatever you see on the news is nothing compared to experiencing it. Uh, we went down, we helped a lady clean out her house. We went to subdivision on Fort Myers Beach. All the houses on the street had six and a half feet of water in them. And they all need to be, everything needs to be stripped out, right down to the frame, you know. So uh, the kids from the school were just amazing. Some of the teachers have worked really hard. Uh, I drove and I tried to do a little work, but I'm too old. <laughs> but really, uh, they, they stripped out all this saturated furniture and um, started ripping out the wallboards. Uh, you have to see it. To believe it really it's just it's amazing and through all of this uh, we talked to some of the neighbors down there and you know nobody's nobody that we talked to is saying woe is me i'm sorry about this they just we got to move on so uh that's a blessing and the kids were just a blessing the uh, school took donations i think I would, it only took two or three days with baskets of personal products baby formula diapers Toilet paper, paper towels, lots of water, and we went through the neighborhoods, and the kids went door to door passing out the baskets, and yeah, what a what a reception they got. I mean, the people were so grateful, and it's just it was just amazing to see, you know, God working through these kids and actually um, having the people experience God's love, you know, through the kids, and uh, the lady whose house we cleaned out. Uh, she's not a believer, but uh, Beth DeCarpo, she she uh, purchased a Bible. We all signed the Bible, and we presented it to her. And she said, uh, all of my belongings, all of my books have been ruined, but I certainly will cherish this one. You know, So uh, we prayed for her. She broke down in tears. And, um, you know, I, who knows? God will be working in her life, but uh, these kids and faculty were just amazing. And like I said, these people definitely saw the love of Christ yesterday through that, our efforts. And it's uh, going to be a long time before they recover down there. It's a real mess. But it was, uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. It was a grueling day, but I think we were all felt good about doing God's work for sure. Thanks, Don. And they wouldn't have got there if Don hadn't driven. So, you know, Don's uh, got a CDL, so 
it always helps when you have a guy with a CDL. You know, he wasn't. He doesn't want anyone to know that. Good thing we're not recording this and putting it out you know, for public consumption for the entire world to see. That's Don Bergamini, B E R G. We're gonna we're, we're gonna pray before Lanny starts. Um, also in the back, someone handed us, and we don't typically we don't do politics in class, but someone did provide us with a list of um, conservative voices, people who are running for office. If that's interest of interest to you. Uh, that's in the back. You're welcome to take that. We're getting ready to have an election. And some people say, well, I don't know who these local people are who to vote for. This is a guide. It was provided by um, Gene Broderick from Golden Airs. So if you're interested in one of those, feel free to take that. If you're not, feel free to just leave it there. Don't like to face it. If you, do, if you don't agree with them, that's fine. Just leave it there. <laughs> it can be civil, right? Um, so let's open in a word of prayer, and then we'll have Lenny get us started. All right, Lord God Almighty, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege to I worship you in our worship service this morning. Thank you for the privilege of hearing how you worked through our school families uh, to touch the life of this one woman there in Fort Myers, um, to tangibly touch her life, to show her the love of Jesus in her home with kids and adults working side by side to clear out the muck and gook uh, in her home. And Lord, I pray that you would use your Holy Spirit to clear out the muck and gook of her sin and call her to righteousness, call her to you. Uh, Lord Jesus, and for the neighbors who were impacted by those delivering baskets of goods, you know, just in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray that you would use those efforts, that the people there that were so affected um, can see uh, that material possessions are, are not where it's at. They come and they go. Lord, you are the one who is faithful. You, you never leave and you never forsake. Uh, thank you for this week's video as Alani will walk us through, Lord, this reality that, look, there's morality for for there to be goodness there has to be an objective standard well you are good you i remember jesus saying why do you call me good only god is good and that's because you are god and you are the god that we love and that we worship so thank you for this week's lesson thank you for the privilege to study it together now it's in jesus name we pray amen all right Lanny. thank you sir Thank you. All right. Well, I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit of a different type of argument than what we've been looking at. For the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at all of these other arguments dealing with uh, by studying the world itself, looking out there, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, this leads to God in some way. There is a universe. There must be a God that created it. There uh, is this uh, amazing complexity of the way the universe has been brought together, Amazing uh, the fine-tuning arguments that we looked at. There must be uh, a super intellect that monkeyed with physics. Whenever we looked at the issues related to the, uh, the origin of life itself, life can only come from life. Therefore, there must be a being that has life in and of themselves in order to create life. We saw that when last week we uh, did the second side of that coin, which was uh, issues related to evolution and some of the difficulties related to that. Today we're looking at an argument for God's existence that is different than what we've been considering. All of those other arguments were studying the natural world itself, looking out outside of ourselves, looking at the world. This argument is actually looking more at ourselves. We have inside information on the moral argument. And I, this is one of those arguments that um, it wasn't the first one that I learned when I first started getting into apologetics and philosophy of religion, but this was the first argument that really kind of grabbed my imagination. And the reason for that was because, um, you know, I was young and idealistic and I had these strong moral sensibilities. And it began uh, being hammered home to me. Are these moral sensibilities that I have, things that are right, things that are wrong, or these beliefs that I have that are right or wrong, are they just mere opinions, or is there any sort of foundation for them that makes something right and wrong? Are we just, whenever somebody says, whatever the issue is, you know, uh, bringing up politics, it, it comes up. Whenever somebody says abortion is a human right or abortion is a moral wrong, are they just saying something on the level of, I like broccoli or I like Rocky Road ice cream? Is that really what it's kind of left at? Or are we saying that you're doing something morally wrong whenever you kill a child in the womb, or you're violating a woman's rights to her own personal autonomy if you prevent abortion? Are those just mere opinions, or are we actually touching something that is objective about the world and saying that you're doing something that is morally harmful to an individual. And so this is one of those kind of personal arguments. And we have information where you don't need to be a scientist. You just need to reflect on your own personal life in order for this one right here to work. Now, a couple things that we need to uh, understand about this argument. Number one, a couple key issues. The issue is not 
Oh, sorry. I forgot I had this set up like this right here. I'll put all of them. I'll put all of them up. All right, number one. The issue is not can you be a good person without believing in God? You actually can be. And now when, when I say good person, I mean here not in the sense of being sinful. I mean just a normal, decent individual. You know, how we deal with one another on this mortal coil of a planet. Um, being able to just get along. Do you have to believe in God in order to be a quote unquote good person, a decent individual? Yeah, you can be a good person without believing in God, uh, as far as like the world is concerned. You can go along. You don't have to kill anybody. You don't have to steal. You don't have to thieve. You just, you're just living better than, the, uh, than your philosophy allows. Can unbelievers de develop good ethical systems? Well, technically, yeah. I've got some ethics textbooks in my classroom that are developed by atheists. And honestly, if you didn't know that they were atheists, you would think that they would fit really well with Christian worldviews and approaches to the world. Yeah, they borrow it. Yeah, that's what we're working for. We're getting there, but I'm just saying, what, the reason why I put this up here is because one of my great frustrations is sometimes I would listen to, uh, I listened to a lot more back in the day instead of now, but I used to listen to a lot of talk radio, and occasionally you'd have somebody call in and like, you know, you can't be a good person unless you believe in God, and the radio host would be like, well, what about this person, this person, this person, right here? and they'd all be atheists, and the person would be like, yeah, I guess they're decent individuals. Oh, see, you don't need God in order to be a good person. And it was always frustrating, but that's only like half of it. What we're trying to get to is what you see on the uh, bottom of the screen here. The issue is, can you actually justify that goodness? Can you actually justify your moral system rather than it just being mere opinion or some sort of social convention? The idea that we just kind of get together, we make some sort of social contract that, yeah, you know what? You know, murder is probably a bad thing. Yeah, we probably should just agree not to murder one another. Is that all it is? You know, lying and theft, you know, they're just kind of social taboos, but not really bad not really wrong we'll just call it wrong you know it just kind of you know works out better if we don't do it but this creates a problem what happens if you're just a cosmic accident this is why the last couple topic uh last couple weeks have been so important because it leads into this one right here isn't there some sort of conflict whenever we tell people tell kids hey you know what you're just a cosmic accident happy accident nonetheless but you're just a cosmic accident some star somewhere exploded and you're just a collocation of all of these atoms coming together that made you, and you just happen to be here. So thank your lucky stars that you're here. Quite literally, that's all you've got are lucky stars. Oh, and by the way, there are things that are morally good and bad. Well, wait a minute. I thought I was an accident. So we have this conflict that we're telling kids. On one hand, we're telling them that they're uh, – socially, we're telling them that they're a – uh, that they're an accident of nature. And on the other hand, we're saying you need to actually abide by certain social rules in order to be a good person. You can say certain things in public. You can't say certain things in public. And so I want to read a poem from a guy named Steve Turner. And it's uh, kind of long, but it kind of delves into this idea of what happens whenever you have this sort of... Uh, naturalistic, uh, a philosophically naturalistic viewpoint. And this is actually two different poems. You have the first one called Creed, you know, what we believe as a postmodern society. And then you have this other one, which is called, um, oh, sorry, do, 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 do. Chance. That's right. Yeah. And the second poem is Chance. But here's the first one. <clears throat> we believe in Max Freud and Darwin. We believe that everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything's getting better despite evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated, and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the one we read was. They all believe in love and goodness. They only defer on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. We believe that after death comes the nothing, because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end, if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, except perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson, what is selected is average, what's average is normal, what's normal is good. 
We believe in total disarmament. We, we believe there are direct links between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors and the Russians would be sure to follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions, and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly, the universe will readjust, history will alter, and we believe there is no absolute truth except the truth. There is no absolute truth. We believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought. And so then you have the follow-up postscript called chance. If everybody is just a cosmic accident. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear, state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on rampage, whites go looting, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. That's really powerful. If you're just a cosmic accident, it really doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And it's not just Christians that say this. Atheists recognize this as well. Now, before I get it, uh, into a series of quotes that kind of show uh, that, that are going to show this, why is it that so many people have common moral convictions? Paul puts it this way right here in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. He says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, and while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The thing is, because we are made in God's image, we have embedded deeply within us is this general moral law, which is why even whenever you have cultures that do have these different types of moralities, you don't have radically different types of moralities. What you have are uh, variations on morality. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this in the book Abolition of Man, if, if you've ever read that one. He talks about whenever you look at all these different cultures, they don't really have these radically different moralities. Is there any culture that actually prioritizes cowardice? No. In reality, there's not even a culture that actually prioritizes or gives priority to murder. What they do is that they just say, oh, what we're doing is just not considered murder. So whenever the Nazis end up putting the Jews into the concentration camps, they didn't see what they were doing was murder. They saw it as ethnic cleansing. That's not murder. Whenever you have a tribe going out and killing another tribe and eating them, that's not wrong because that other tribe is less than human. I, wouldn't, I would never murder my own grandmother, but I can murder that person's grandmother. That's okay. As one person put it, it's like, in some cultures they love their neighbors, in other cultures they eat them. Do you have a preference? It has been popularly stated. Do I have it? Yeah, there it is. All right. Dostoevsky was a uh, Christian. You may know he was uh, author, wrote a lot of different books. He very famously said, uh, had the statement, if God does not exist, all things are permissible. And this was uh, a line that was put into the mouths of one of his characters. Uh, I believe this one was from Crime and Punishment. Or Brothers Carriage Miles Alpha. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. And a lot of people don't like this idea. What do you mean all things are permissible if there is no God? Well, He's just actually putting in literary form what other people have already come to a conclusion on. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist, he puts it like this way. If God does not exist, we find no values or commands in, to turn to which legitimize our conduct. Because there's nothing that grounds it. There's nothing that grounds the idea of what you're doing is right and wrong. How about this right here? A.J. Ayer has this statement right here. Value judgment serves an expressive function. They give vent to feelings as a statement, or as they are emotive or non-cognitive. They are factually meaningless. Ooh, there we go. Now, A.J. Ayer held a position uh, that's called non-cognitivism. For him, any sort of moral statement you made was just an expression of your feelings of, ooh, I like something, yay, or I don't like something, we call it bad, but it's just my, my feelings are going, ooh, boo. But they're factually meaningless. Again, Jean-Paul Sartre, the values are created by the subject. 
You get to determine what is right and wrong. This is Protagoras. Man is the measure of all things. So if you decide that murder is not okay, and I do, who wins? I like broccoli. You don't. That's kind of the position we're left in. Another explanation you have would become for somebody like Bertrand Russell, famous uh, 20th century atheist. Ethics arises from the pressures of the community on the individual. Man does not always instinctively feel the desires of which are useful to his herd. The herd being anxious that the individual should act in its interest has in Invented various devices for causing the individual's interest to be in harmony with that of the herd. One of these is morality. There's nothing objectively right or wrong. It's just useful to human behavior. It's just, you know what, there's a convenience, there's an efficiency if we don't go around murdering and stealing from one another. But isn't, it's not really wrong. It's not really wrong if you hurt somebody. It's just inconvenient. More recently, you have somebody like Michael Roos teaches at FSU, or used to, I don't know if he's still there. Morality is a biological adaptation no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. It's an illusion. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. You may not like rape, but it's an illusion. You may not like theft and lying and murder, Okay, it's an illusion if you think it has any deeper meaning than the fact that you just don't like it. It's an aid to your survival that we don't go around doing those things, but they don't really exist. There is no real right and wrong. Now, I will say that Ruse actually, ha he's inconsistent on this point right here, because he does think things like torturing children for fun is wrong. He'll actually say, no, that's absolutely wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. Really, Michael? All right. So he is uh, inconsistent. So on one hand, He's got this uh, conflict. He wants to hold this kind of biological adaptation of morality on one hand, but on the other hand, he does recognize that there are just some things out there that are just beyond the pale of acceptability. Can he have both of those viewpoints? Well, not consistently, you can't. Richard Dawkins put it this way, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, some people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no other good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. So does the murderer just dance to his music? Does the rapist just dance to his music? Did the prison guards at Auschwitz dance to the music of their genes, or did they do something morally wrong? Likewise, the person that engages in self-sacrificial behavior, that acts nobly, that is loving towards others and truly altruistic, are they just dancing to their DNA or do they deserve some sort of praise for doing things that are morally right? Just blind, pitiless indifference. All right. So with those happy thoughts, let's turn to the argument. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. So there's a couple of different ways that you'll actually see this argument portrayed. Uh, the way I think Frank does it in his talk is kind of the more classic formulation that, you know, if you have any sort of law, there has to be a lawgiver, there's a moral law, therefore there's a moral lawgiver. That's a very classic formulation. Uh, I like the, uh, the formulation of it that in your text, or your, I guess your little book there, you'll see, excuse me, a second form of it, which is a type of um, what's called a modus tollens type argument. And so it's put as a conditional. And he puts it like this right here. If God does not exist, Objective moral values do not exist. All right, so this is a weird way of phrasing it, but hopefully you see from those quotes that we just went through that you have a lot of people that actually do agree. Yeah, if there is no God, there are no objective moral values. There are some people that will try and hold like, no, you can have no God and objective moral values. Uh, I think we'll deal with some of those if, if we have time, but uh, those are large, those are fairly, fairly rare to come across. Um, mainly because of the type of incoherence that it requires. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about it later. So by and large, historically it's been understood that if God doesn't exist, you do not have any objective moral values, right? There's nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA doesn't care, right? The problem is, and maybe you've got this, don't you want to be able to say some things are really right and wrong? Don't you live your life that way? 
don't we really at bottom know there really are things that are truly good and truly evil? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We really do want to be able to say there are things that right, if anybody hurts my daughter, by golly, I'm Papa Bear is going to come out. There are things that are right and wrong. We know this, but this creates a problem. And so the form of this argument, again, is called a modus tollens. So uh, it, you have your conditional statement and then the consequent of it. And for this type of argument to work, you either have to affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent. So you either have to say God doesn't exist and therefore there are no objective moral values. That's how the argument would go. But here, what we're doing is what's called denying the consequent. We're actually giving the opposite of what we see in that first statement. So if God doesn't exist, there are no objective moral values, but there are objective moral values. Well, the way this type of argument works, you actually end up denying the antecedent, in which case that would just mean God exists. So strangely enough, if you can get somebody to accept that first premise, if God doesn't exist, there's no moral values. If you can get them to accept just one moral reality, whatever it is, it can be something good, it can be something evil. If they really think that it is objectively good or objectively wrong, doesn't matter, then they really actually have to affirm that there is a divine reality out there. Otherwise, it's just opinion. At core, it's just opinion. It might be individual opinion. It might be cultural opinion. It might be social opinion. It might be some other opinion, but it's opinion nonetheless. It is a complete type of relativism. And that's going to be incompatible with their belief that there is at least one thing that is really right or really wrong. Isn't that weird? It's a weird idea. If there's one thing that is really right or really wrong, God must exist. We'll actually revisit this a little bit more whenever we get to um, the problem of evil in a few weeks. This is going to come back around because it has a surprising uh, twist to it. And I'll go ahead and give you the, uh, I guess, spoiler alert. Basically, the problem of evil, if you are familiar with, is the idea that how can God be good and powerful and all-loving and there be evil in the world. And since there's evil in the world, God can't be all powerful, all loving, all good, or maybe there's no God at all. The problem is, what do you mean by evil? Is it something that you just don't like, or is it really cruel? Is it really unjust? But where did you get this idea of justice and injustice? You can't have that unless there is a divine reality. So it turns out that the problem of evil actually ends up pointing towards God on the back end. So again, an odd idea. But we'll talk about that whenever the time comes. All right, so whenever we're talking about moral values or these objective moral values, what are we talking about? Well, they have a couple different characteristics. Number one, we're talking about those values that prescribe moral action. They aren't saying the way that people do behave. They're saying what people should be or how people should behave or what they ought to do. That's what moral actions are. It is true that people go around murdering each other and taking and stealing from one another. That's what people do, but should they? Whenever you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription, all right, take two pills every day for the next couple weeks, right? That's what you should do. But what is it you actually do? Well, if you're a good patient, you'll end up taking the pills. You'll do what, you're, what the doctor has prescribed. What do a lot of people do? They'll take it for a couple days. They're like, oh, I feel better, and they stop taking the pills. So what people do is actually quite a bit different than what they should do. The law says one thing, but people act in a different way. So the, what I'm getting at is that people's actions don't really actually reveal so much what the law is. It's what they should do is actually what we're talking about. Is that's where you see that second one. It says what people should do. It's these oughts. Lastly, and this is the one that's kind of controversial, when we talk about objective moral values, they are true regardless if anybody believes it or even knows about it. The common thought experiment you'll, uh, you'll hear on this one here. Um, pretend for a moment uh, that Germany won World War II. Just pretend. And they were able to convince everybody that they did the right thing by rounding up the Jews and putting them in concentration camps. Would that have actually made it right? Everybody in society believes it's okay because everybody that thought it was wrong has now been killed. So everybody believes that it was right to do that. Would that make it right? No. All right, so that's what we mean by objective moral values. It's those things that are really good or evil, even independent of our knowledge of it or our beliefs about it. Okay? 
So the key question is, how do we know the subjective moral reality is real? Well, a couple ways, and we're going to talk about these individually. Number one, we can know uh, if there were no moral value or no moral laws, we wouldn't make excuses for violating it. I'm going to go through each one of these. We know it by our reactions. That's related to that first one. In a sense, whenever we talk about the moral law is undeniable, we don't mean it in the logical sense. We mean this in a practical sense. We understand it as the unchanging standard of justice, and it defines a real difference between moral positions. So let's go through these one at a time. This is, is going to reveal that I think everybody in here already believes that there are objective moral values. Like You're kind of beating a dead horse here, but it would be helpful to kind of <laughs> see how, uh, how this works. Let's go to this first one right here. If there were no moral law, you wouldn't make excuses for violating it. Has anybody ever read like a book one of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity? All right, a couple people have. This is what he's talking about in that book, in book one. He goes, we all quarrel, you know, or you've heard people quarrel, right? And by quarreling, he means like true arguments. Like you're trying to give reasons for something, a justification for the actions that, you have, uh, that you've done. When somebody's cutting in line, what do you say to them? You're just you're standing in line, you're waiting your turn. All of a sudden, they just come in out of nowhere. They don't seem to know the people that's before them. They don't seem to be holding line. They just kind of cut in line. Have they done anything right or wrong? Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Dude, what are you doing? What does the person normally say? Do they say, oh, yeah, my bad, and then they just happily go to the back? No. What do they do? They usually try and justify in some way. Oh, no. My friend Jim was holding my spot for me. Why does he say that? Why doesn't he say, you know, forget your standards? Why doesn't he say that? What he's trying to do is he's trying to show you that he hasn't actually violated the very law that you're this kind of moral acceptance, this uh, moral understanding that we just assume. He's saying, oh, I haven't really violated that. I am excused from the type of behavior you were expecting. That's why we do it. And we do that too. I did that to my students the other day. I got uh, I, I was frustrated with something that happened um, on uh, – they were supposed to take a, a, a quiz in technology. It's great when it works. When it doesn't work, it's very frustrating. And um, uh, my first class had already taken the quiz, and I, we do this uh, – I have them do it on their iPad, and just none of the iPads could connect to the uh, internet. For some reason, something happened, and they couldn't take the test. And I was really frustrated because this was putting me behind the eight ball. It was coming to the end of the quarter. Oh, it was really – and I got angry with a student who, who made it a harmless joke. I was like, you know, go ahead and put your iPads away. He goes, but then we can't play our games. It's like, I don't care, you know. <laughs> and so – and then he was like – I was just joking. I was like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I was upset at this right here. I'm not really mad at you. I know it was a joke. But even my statement on that actually proved the rule. I was trying to say that, please don't be angry with me. Um, the, reason, the reason why I did something wrong was because of something else. I was trying to pass the buck on something else. I should be excused from this type of moral law. And we all do that, right? It is interesting. It's one of those realities where whenever we have our bad behavior, we always chalk it up to something else that has made us act badly. We're driving in traffic or whatever, and somebody cuts us off, and so we get a little bit more aggressive, right? We, we do that, and we say, oh, well, I would not have been driving this way. I would have been speeding if that person hadn't cut me off and maybe missed the light and maybe be late and all. It's always somebody else. We always want to put down our bad behavior to something else, somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault. But whenever we're good, who do we want to chalk that up to? Me. That's the way we act. That's the way we are. But the thing is, if there is no moral law, then why do we make excuses for violating it? Why do we have, to, why do we have this instinctive need to justify our actions or our statements to other people if, there, if this moral law doesn't exist? The only reason we do that is because we instinctively feel it. We know it's there. We know that in some way we violated it, and we're trying to find out. We're trying to lawyer our way around trying to uh, – being held guilty for violating that law. Yes, sir? Uh, having the satisfaction of, the moment of being right? Yeah, I'm sure that plays into it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, Because I'm a, I'm a prideful person. 
I don't want to be wrong. I want other people to accept the fact that I'm right and they're not. And th that's the way I, uh, a lot of human nature is that way. So what happens when you get two people that are really bullheaded and both prideful and both can't be wrong? Fireworks, right? I mean, it just, oh, you've seen the flame wars online. It happens. You can. But what if the other person doesn't agree? Like, no, I've got to be proven right. You've got problems. That's right. You've got real problems. But all of this is under the assumption that the other person is wrong and I'm right. They need to see things from my perspective. And if they don't, then they've got a real moral problem. All of that is assuming that there's a real moral law that's being violated in some way. So we make excuses for violating this thing. Related to that, you can actually tell what people's beliefs are about the moral law by their reactions rather than their actions. People will go out and slander. They will go out and steal from other people. But what happens as soon as you slander or steal from them? Yeah. <laughs> right? Them is fighting words. Uh, J.P. Moreland has, uh, he's a uh, professor at Biola. At one point in time, he used to do college ministry. And he was talking with a student who believed, uh, and he was in the kids' dorm room. And uh, they were talking about this idea of there being a real right and wrong. Oh, is that one not working? Oh no. Preventive, preventive maintenance. Okay. All right. So anyway, he's talking with this student. And the student is holding this position that there is no such thing as right and wrong, it's completely conventional, uh, might makes right, you know, whatever, uh, is complete relativism. And he's not making any headway with him. So he's like, well, you know, thank you for your time. I've enjoyed your talk. Hopefully, we'll see you around again on campus. And as he gets up uh, from the kids' dorm, he starts unplugging the kids' uh, stereo. The kid's like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, this is a nice stereo. I'm taking it. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Well, why not? Well, because it's wrong. Well, 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 wait a minute. You've just told me this whole time that there is no such thing as right and wrong. I like your stereo. I'm bigger than you are. I'm taking the stereo. Now, cut to chase. He did not take the stereo, right? He was making the point. As soon as this kid had uh, something done to him, all of a sudden, he became a very strong moral absolutist. Moral, moral rights and wrongs really hit hard when they happen to us. Somebody just comes up and punch you in the nose. What's your reaction? Hey, what are you doing? Right? Is your reaction going to be, normally your reaction is, you shouldn't be doing that. And you might respond in different ways. Like, you might, oh my goodness, you shouldn't be doing that. Some people might try and fight back. You know, you know we'll have different reactions. None of us are going to go and say, oh, man, you got me good. Yeah, good for you. You must have just felt like doing that. You have the other, um, uh, other story popular uh, uh, that makes its rounds. You had this uh, philosophy professor who was doing his ethics class, and this uh, kid wrote a paper on moral relativism. Did all the research, footnoted it right, formatted it right, put in this nice red folder, turned it in to the professor. I think uh, Frank even gives that example. And, you know, the professor you know, reads it and is like, oh, I don't like this color folder, gives it back, F. And the kids are all incensed, like, oh my goodness, I did, I've met everything that the syllabus requires. This is a well researched paper. It's like, oh, but your whole argument is that there is no moral rights and wrongs. I don't like the color of this folder. You get an F. Has the professor done something wrong? Well, we want to say yes, but the student is under no obligation or doesn't have any grounds from which he can object to the, what the professor has done. You can only object to what the professor has done if there is a moral right and wrong. And so we know that there is a moral law based on our reactions rather than our actions. And so that's what we mean by this third statement, that the moral law is undeniable. Again, it's not, a, it's not the logical undeniability we saw in that first week. Remember the first week we talked about those undeniable truths that, you know, whenever you mention them, they reveal themselves. Like, I can't speak a word of English. Well, wait a minute. You just, you just said that in English. It's undeniable you can speak English because you just said that. Right? There is no absolute truth. Well, wait a minute. Then you're, but you're uttering something that you think is true. So it's undeniable there's truth. What that is might be difficult to find, but you can't deny it. 
when we're talking about the mor uh, moral law, we're not talking about that type of logical undeniable undeniability. We're talking about a practical undeniability. Practically, you cannot go through your life living as if there is no moral law. There is this, uh, this practical aspect to it. We live our lives as if this thing really exists. Now, is that just illusory, as Michael Roos says? Is it just an illusion? Do we delude ourselves and we think that there are these moral rights and wrongs? Or the reason why it's practically undeniable is because there is a being that actually oversees our lives, that knows how we're supposed to live and knows what is best for us and has made it so that if we abide by those rules and by those laws, we actually can have, in the classical sense, the good life. We can know what is right and wrong, and therefore we can actually achieve, in a sense, happiness. And when I talk about happiness, I don't mean in the contemporary sense. I mean in the classical sense of true contentedness, uh, contentedness, blessedness. So there is this practical undeniability. You get into the idea also that this moral law is the standard of justice. I kind of gave you a hint on this one just a little bit ago. This was uh, you know, coming back to Lewis for just a moment. He put it this way right here. As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. That's just the classical problem of evil. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Where did you get this idea that something is right and wrong, something is evil and good? Where does that idea come from? Is it just social convention? Is it? You have to really ask yourself, or is there something that's outside of you that is the standard by which you're judging everything else? So not only does it provide this kind of unsta uh, this unchanging standard, uh, and this is where he also – Frank used that map of uh, Scotland. You know, you had this uh, map A, map B of Scotland. How do you know which one is actually the better map? Well, you just compare it against real Scotland and you'll know which one actually more accurately represents the real thing. The only reason why we can say that somebody is acting good and somebody is acting bad is because we actually have this type of scale that we're judging it against. And we know that some people more nearly meet that uh, measurement rather than other people. We know that Mother Teresa more nearly measures up to what is a good person rather than somebody like Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or somebody like that. And then lastly, the moral law also identifies the difference between a real moral position. Again, Lewis once more. The moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them by, both by some standard, saying that one of them conforms more to that standard more nearly than the other. But the standard that measures those two things is something different from either. You are in fact comparing, comparing them with some real morality, admitting that there is no such thing as a real right uh, that there is such a thing as real right, independent of what people think, and that some people's ideas get nearer to that than others. All right. So again, if morals are relative, if it is just a matter of social convention, as uncomfortable as it is, Hitler and Teresa are morally the same thing. And that is a weird – at an objective level, at an ontological level, we might – uh, we might prioritize as a society one person's actions over another, but we have no ground to stand on when we do that. This is the difference of what Frank was talking about, the epistemological versus the ontological difference. This is why atheists can actually be, relatively speaking, good people. They can actually develop good uh, ethical textbooks. They can actually live, in many ways, more moral lives than a lot of Christians. Why? Because we all have within us that moral law. We all know it. We Epistemologically, uh, at the realm of what we know, we know it. We know that there is right and wrong. The problem is the ontological basis, the reality basis, the basis of being. What grounds that which we know is true? For the atheist, there's nothing that grounds it. But for the theist, there is, namely God's existence. God himself, the nature of who God is, grounds and makes something right and wrong. And so whenever God gives a moral command, a moral duty of some sort, it's rooted in his very nature. And so there is this ontological basis for say, making something right and wrong. There might still be the question of trying to figure this out sometimes, depending on what the, the issue is. But there is a grounding for it. 
This is why those quotes that we looked at at the very beginning play such an important role. Because the existentialists, the atheists, the modern evolutionists, they understand that if there is no divine reality, there's nothing that grounds what we say is right and wrong. It's just mere convention. It is mere herd mentality. It's an illusion. It's a delusion. What we're doing is we're playing word games. It might be convenient. It might be efficient. It might be useful. But there is no real right and wrong if there is no God. So you might be able to develop a decent system, but you have nothing that grounds it. All right, so as we saw with like Ruse and Dawkins uh, earlier, a couple things. If we are just cosmic accidents, morality has to be a delusion. We already saw that. Self-sacrifice is not really a good thing. Our actions are really just extensions of our DNA, uh, those kind of um, genetic pressures that make us act in one particular way or another. But there's some real problems with this. Number one, we've already talked about, do people, do we really want to live lives as if thinking that people are just dancing to their DNA? Nothing is ever right. Nothing is ever really wrong. We're just acting out our genetics. But there's a real, some real problems with this idea. Number one, we know that morality can't be based in this type of uh, evolutionary understanding because morality is not a material thing. But under evolution, all there is is materialism. But right and wrong, justice, injustice, these things, self-sacrifice, nobility, generosity, those are actually um, immaterial characteristics. Those have qualities that aren't based in what is physical. And so you can see the question, can you show somebody a pound of hate or a pound of love? Well, no, those are actions that are performed. Exactly. So what is this thing that we're talking about? It has to be something else. It can't be a physical thing. Even the ancient Greeks saw this. I mean, this was kind of the main argument for like Socrates and Plato. Whenever people would talk about things that are beautiful, we're going to come to Plato here in just a moment. But whenever we talk about these different qualities that, that are shared, whenever we see somebody showing love here and love, love over here, what is it that binds them together and makes it love? It has to be some other thing, and it can't be the material act. It can't be the material thing. It can't be the individual action. It has to be something else. It has to be something immaterial. It has to be that universal that makes it the same thing. Well, that's a big problem if you're just a philosophical naturalist, a philosophical materialist. If all you're saying is there exists just the matter, well then, what are we referring to when we talk about hate and love? Morality is not just mere instinct because we have competing instincts. You're by the, you're by the side, of, side of a river and you see this kid who's struggling, who's clearly not going to survive much longer, and you're a strong swimmer. Do you jump into the water or not? On one hand, you've got, competing in, you've got these competing instincts. On one hand, you've got the instinct to help a child. Right? Protect the youngest amongst us. I need to jump out to this river and save the child. On the other hand, you've got the competing instinct of, I ain't getting in there. I don't want to die. Which instinct do you follow? How do you determine which instinct do you follow? So we have these competing instincts. Likewise, it doesn't account for either self-destructive or self-sacrificing behavior. Same, same scenario. What makes the firefighter run into a burning building? He's got competing instincts. On one hand, he wants to be safe. He wants to be there for his family. On the other hand, he also knows there's people in there that need to be helped. There's no explanation for why survival of the fittest is a good thing. It's just assumed. What makes it good? Why should it matter? I mean, whenever you look at the existentialists, their question, whenever you read like Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, those guys, their question is not how you should live. Their question is why should you live at all? Because whether you're alive for just seven, uh, seven minutes, seven years, or 70 years, it's just one step from the womb to the tomb. Why does it matter? Their question wasn't how should you live, why should you live, was the big question. There's no clear definition or a clear understanding why just survival itself is good. It's certainly there. We certainly feel it. We want to survive. You know, The survival instinct is something that's really strong within us. But why is it good? Why does it matter? Nor does it explain why anybody should obey these biologically directed statements. In, in uh, evolutionary biology, fittest just means you're able to pass along your genetic material. So it's just what does happen. It's not anybody decides it. It's just you being able to pass on your genetic material. That's what, that's what decides it. It's kind of more that happens. Much like 
Uh, natural selection really isn't a guiding force so much. It's more of a description of what has already taken place, which is which is weird because the language that's utilized in in the discussion is this notion of having some sort of sense of purpose to it that it's actually pushing things along. But that's not really what it what it's doing. It doesn't have the power to do anything because natural selection is just a description. It's not a prescriptive. Uh, uh, is not a prescriptive of reality itself. Same thing for the survival of the fittest. Who determines it? Well, it's just, are you able to pass along your genetic material? So it's not anybody deciding it. There's not any guidance to it. Nor is there any statement that that's good. It's just something that we do. Oh, if that's what we do, we just, I guess we call it good. It doesn't make it good. All right, well, there's absolutely a lot more to say, um, but... Time is upon us, so we're going to go ahead and close it there. I'll stay around for a few minutes if you have any other questions or anything. I know Darren's got an announcement to make, but hopefully um, this actually closes out our section on the arguments for God's existence. Uh, starting next week, um, to borrow Frank's joke, Darren's going to come up and start doing miracles uh, up on the stage. No, so he's going to be uh, turning water into grape juice uh, will be his first one. You know, so anyway, but we'll, uh, we'll continue, and I guess next week we're in the uh, sanctuary. Yeah, so here yeah. we go. All right, so uh, what I have continued to tell the group that meets in my home on Tuesday nights is don't, uh, don't overthink right, this series, right? The first uh, week is what is truth, right? The fact that you have to have a grounds to believe that there's truth that exists, otherwise you can't get any further than an argument with somebody or a conversation with someone. And then the next couple of weeks have just been arguments for the existence of God, not using God's word yet. But next week that changes. So next week we're going to start to open God's word and think – you know, are, are miracles a possibility? Do miracles exist? Could they exist? All right. And then he'll start launching that conversation into opening up the New Testament. And is the New Testament true? So the first argument is the cosmological argument. All right. So what is that in one sentence? Anybody? Now that's the uh, cosmological argument. The, the cosmos exists. All right. It had a beginning. So there must have been a beginner, all right? So you take two weeks of all this dedicated science, boil it down to one sentence, that's it, all right? The cosmos exists. You, we exist in a cosmos, a universe. It had a beginning. Science proves that, so there must have been a beginner. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. You don't have to explain all the rest of this stuff, point them to the video or have them read the book. Second one is the teleological argument, all right? Forget that word because no one knows what it means, all right? So one sentence, what is that argument? That there's a design there's perceived and scientific proof of design. So if there is design, there must be a designer. All right? So there's two weeks there of your video series simplified to one sentence. All right? And then the third one here is the moral argument. All right? So one sentence on that. Say it again. That there's a standard, right? Morality exists. All right? So there must be some, some moral agent beyond us that sets that morality. So don't get caught up and confused and all the arguments or, or all the proofs behind them, all right? As a Christian, in this series, we want you to be affirmed in your faith. Every video you watch should be faith-affirming. You don't have to understand it all. That's not the point. The point is when you watch it, you're like, mm, I always knew that was true. I just don't have half an hour in that kind of vocabulary to say it, right? Same thing you come when you hear Lanny. You're like, wow, all right, I'm glad he's teaching this week and not me. That's why Charles left again. Every time I want Charles to lead a lesson, he skips out on us, right? So don't, don't, uh, don't get discouraged if you watch a video and you think, I can't repeat this 30-minute video to my friend. You're not supposed to. Don't worry about that. Here's what it is. Do you, is your faith more solid after watching this series than before? Can you believe that there is a God who created this universe, who, created the, who designed the universe for life, who designed you for a purpose? and who has a plan for your life, right? That's what we want you to get out of it. Now, all the rest of it is awesome, but you can always point people to watch the video. Say, look, I can't explain this video, but it's an awesome. If you're, if you're struggling with scientific evidence for the or, for that God exists, then watch this video or read this book, all right? I'll talk with you. We'll have coffee, and then you watch the video. We'll talk after, <laughs> right? You don't have to have all the answers. Don't worry about it. That's not the point here. The point is to be faith-affirmed. All right, so that you're willing to start conversations and have conversations about Jesus. So next week, it's going to turn. We're going to start talking, moving to probably information that you're most used to hearing. We're going to start getting into the New Testament. All right, we're going to get away from the scientific arguments, start looking at the New Testament itself, miracles, Jesus, the gospel writers, 
proofs of, of historical texts, that type of thing. All right, so we're about the midpoint, right? We're at the midpoint of this series. We're on the downhill now. We've reached the peak. We're going downhill. It's going to get faster as we go. And we appreciate you guys sticking around and, and watching it and enjoying this together. Hopefully you're enjoying uh, the series. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. And uh, the prayer sheets are in the back. All right, so you've got stuff for us to pray for you about. Put it on there. We'll put it out so people can be praying. There's a lot of needs. There's a lot going on right now. Anyone else feel just the general stress of life? It's just kind of oppressive right now. It's crazy right now. I think that's just the closer we get to the Lord coming back. These end days, it's going to be stressful. So if you're feeling that stress, just know for a little bit, it's everyone's feeling it. All right? They are also extremely exciting times. We are seeing God work like never before as well. Amen? Amen. God is good. God is good. All right, let's close in prayer. Uh, Lord God Almighty, thank you for today. Thank you for just the awesome God that you are. Lord, we just we worship and we glorify you. Uh, thank you for the privilege to just listen to these minds that you have given us, these uh, great minds who can explain these wonderful concepts, science that points to you. Um, you're, you're just an amazing, miraculous, supernatural God. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through creation. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through your, your written word. You are uh, wonderful and beyond comprehension. So, Lord, we just love you. We look forward to seeing your son, Jesus, either when he blows that trumpet and calls us all home together, if he takes us one at a time, or we just look forward to that day where our faith can become sight. Uh, walk with us this week, Lord God. Help us. Uh, those who are sick, Lord, I pray that you would sustain them and heal them. Um, get them through. Lord, for Wellmont coming in this week, Lord, I pray that you would bless this new school uh, that comes to this new campus. I just, Lord, just pray that the children would be comfortable here, uh, that the teachers and the administration would find a new home, that they could be in peace uh, and just enjoy and be blessed in teaching children about you here on this campus. Pray for this carnival coming up, Lord God, where we know Westgate families and New Heights families will come to our campus. Oh, Lord, we just pray uh, that this place would be a beacon of light in this community for Jesus. Thank you for Northside Christian School, the testimony of uh, faculty and students going into the hard hit hurricane area, uh, areas this weekend, um, pulling out mud and drywall and furniture. Um, just thank you for the privilege to serve you and to impact the lives of others in the name of Jesus. May your name be praised. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Yes, Charles. Yes, praise from Charles. Yeah. I've, I've got a promotion that's going to really help me out to do better. So I'm really thankful to God and the church and everything. Praise the Lord. We've been praying for Charles for a long time. That's praise. It's awesome. Put that on the sheets. We'll put that out. All right. Thanks, guys.